Hey, 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 I'm back. I'm here with my historical fiction list. Okay. All right, so we're going to get started really quickly with The Buddha in the Attic by Julie Atsuka. All right, so this one has been on my list. I have it on my shelf. And I've been wanting to read that for a minute. And it is a short novel, but I've heard nothing but good things about it. It says, in eight incantatory sections, the Buddha in the attic traces the picture bride's extraordinary lives from their arduous journey by boat, where they exchange photographs of their husbands, imagining uncertain futures in an unknown land to their arrival in San Francisco and their tremulous first nights as new wives to their backbreaking work picking fruit in the fields and scrubbing the floors of white women to their struggles to master a new language and a new culture to their experiences in childbirth and then as mothers raising children who will ultimately reject their heritage and their history to the deracinating arrival of war so this one sounds really, really interesting. Like I said, it is on my shelf. If you read this one, drop it below and tell me what you thought about this one and if you think I should actually vote for it. Okay, the next book on the list is When We Lost Our Heads by Heather O'Neill. Okay, this one I've never heard of before, but it says Marie Antoinette is the charismatic spoiled daughter of a sugar baron at 12 years old. With her blonde curls and her unparalleled sense of whimsy, she's the leader of all the children in the Golden Mile, an affluent strip of 19th century Mon Montreal. Until one day in 1873, when Sadie Arnett, dark-haired, sly, and brilliant, moves to the neighborhood. Marie and Sadie are immediately united by their passion and intensity and they attract and repel each other in ways that light each of them on fire. Marie with her bubbly charm sees the light and sweetness in the world whereas Sadie's obsession with darkness is all consuming. Soon their childlike games take on a thrill of danger and then become deadly. Okay. All right, I don't know, but for me personally, I'm not interested in this one at all. I mean, mm, no, nah, doesn't sound like my cup of tea, but you know, it could get through. I don't know. At this point, it's all, it's all open. I don't know what's going to go through and what's not going to go through. Okay, the next one is called Hearsay by Melissa Linhart. It says, they were the first and only all-female gang in the American West. Though the newspapers refuse to give them credit, their exploits don't go unnoticed. Now they've got a rival male gang on their trail and on old score to settle. Margaret Parker and Haiti LaCour never intended to turn outlaw. After being run off their ranch by a greedy cattleman, their family is left destitute. As women alone, they have few choices. Marriage, lying on their backs for money, or holding a gun. For Margaret and Haiti, the choice is simple. With their small makeshift family, the gang pulls off a series of heists across the West. This sounds hella interesting, okay? Uh, never heard of this. But I'm all here for the, you know, for the cowboy, you know, gang women in the West. I'm all for it. Sounds interesting. Okay, next on the list we have Conjure Women. This is by Afia Atorkara. All right, this book, when it came out, I think it was in 2020, I remember reading it and I was like, oh, this looks like it could be kind of good, but I don't know, it was something about it just didn't really push me to really explore it. And then after the fact, I remember that year, I didn't see a lot of people say that they liked it. As a matter of fact, I, said, I heard a lot of people say they dislike this book. But anyway, what's it about? So it says, Conch Woman is a sweeping story that brings the world of the South before and after the Civil War vividly to life. Spanning eras and generations, it tells the lives of three unforgettable women. Miss Maybell, a wise healing woman, her precious and observant daughter, Rue, who is reluctant to follow in her mother's footsteps as a midwife. 
and their master's daughter, Verena. The secrets and bonds among these women and their community come to a head at the beginning of a war and at the birth of an accursed child who sets the townspeople alight with fear and a spreading superstition that threatens their newly won tenuous freedom. Okay, I'm just like, this could either be super good, like I said, or disaster. So I don't really know. I just remember not a lot of people seem to enjoy it. And I can't remember exactly why they couldn't enjoy it. That's what's kind of bugging me. Okay, the next one is The Personal Librarian by Marie Benedict and Victoria Christopher Murray. And I suggested this one. In case you don't know what it's about. In her 20s, Belle DaCosta Green is hired by J.P. Morgan to curate a collection of rare manuscripts, books, and artwork for his newly built Pierpont Morgan Library. Bell becomes a fixture on the New York society scene, one of the most powerful people in the art and book world, known for her impeccable taste and shrewd negotiating for critical works as she helps build a world-class collection. But Bell has a secret, one she must protect at all costs. She was born not Bell da Costa Green, but Bell Marion Greener. She is the daughter of Richard Greener, the first black graduate of Harvard and a well-known advocate for equality. Belle's complexion isn't dark because of her alleged Portuguese heritage that lets her pass as white. Her complexion is dark because she is African-American. So yeah, if that gets through, I'll be happy to reread it. I thought the personal librarian was very well written is very well told story and i am definitely interested in reading anything nonfiction about bell da costa green yeah so it would be nice if this makes it through but i'm not so sure it's going to make it through <clears throat> okay the next one we have on the list is the magician by cone tobin this one i've heard about but i don't know Cone Tolben's new novel opens in a provincial German city at the turn of the 20th century where the boy, Thomas Mann, grows up with a conservative father bound by propriety and a Brazilian mother alluring and unpredictable. Young Mann hides his artistic aspirations from his father and his homosexual desires from everyone. He is infatuated with one of the richest, most cultured Jewish families in Munich and marries the daughter Katya. They have six children. On a holiday in Italy, he longs for a boy he sees on a beach and writes the story Death in Venice. He is the most successful novelist of his time, winner of the Nobel Prize in Literature, a public man whose private life remains secret. He is expected to lead the condemnation of Hitler whom he underestimates. His oldest daughter and son, leaders of bohemianism and of the anti-Nazi movement, share lovers. He flees Germany for Switzerland, France, and ultimately America, living first in Princeton and then in Los Angeles. Okay, so this could be kind of interesting as well, because, I mean, I don't know much about Thomas Mann, and I haven't read any of his novels, but this sounds like it could be really interesting to read. You know, it, it would be, it brings something different to my reading. Okay, now the next one. This one has been on my list forever, okay? Literally forever. And I think it's on my shelf downstairs. And every time I look at it, I don't know why I pass over it. Now, I've heard only excellent things about this particular book. And it is The Pillars of the Earth by Ken Follett. Okay, so this is the first book in what they call the King's Bridge series. This one, if, if this one got through, I'd be really, really happy. Everything readers expect from Follett is here. Intrigue, fast-paced action, and passionate romance. But what makes the Pillars of the Earth extraordinary is the time, the 12th century, the place feudal, England and the subject the building of a glorious cathedral. Follett has recreated the crude flamboyant England of the Middle Ages in every detail. The vast 
forests, the walled towns, the castles, and the monasteries become a familiar landscape. So, yeah, you know, this one just sounds really like that sweeping story that keeps you totally, you know, in, enticed and engrossed the whole time. The only thing is, I think my copy is a mass market paperback and that is a killer for me. Those mass market paperbacks on my eyeballs, I just can't do it. I would be very interested in reading this one. So if it went through, I'd be real happy if this one went through. I'm going to cross my fingers because, yeah, I'm going to need to cross my fingers a lot on these lists. Let me tell you. All right. The next one on this list is one that I've heard of. It's The Rose Garden by Tracy Rees. It says Olive Westerlin lives a privileged, if rather lonely, life in her family's Grand Hampstead home. But she has radical plans for the future of her family. Plans that will shock the high society world she inhabits. For her new neighbor, 12-year-old Otley Finch, London is an exciting playground to explore. Her family have recently arrived from Durham under a cloud of scandal that Otty is blissfully unaware the only shadow over her days is her mother's mysterious illness, which keeps her to her room. Okay, so this kind of, you know, this kind of has one of those uh, mixed storylines. It's like a little bit of upper class living in England alongside maybe a little bit of a mystery or something. I don't know. I'm not essentially interested in this one. But I guess if I had to read it, I would be like, okay, why not? I don't know. Yeah, yeah, I, you know, okay. Okay, the next one, I've heard of this one, but have not, you know, read anything by this particular author. This one is called Birds Without Wings, and it's by Louis de Bernier. This one is one that, yeah, I've heard a lot of people talk about, but... I have never ventured to read it myself. In his first novel since Corelli's Mandolin, Louis de Bernier creates a world, populates it with characters as real as our best friends, and launches it into the maelstrom of 20th century history. The setting is a small village in southwestern An Anatolia. In the waning years of the Ottoman Empire, everyone there speaks Turkish, though they write it in Greek letters. It's a place that has room for professional blasphemer where a broken-hearted Aga finds solace in the arms uh, of a Circassian courtesan who isn't Circassian at all, where a beautiful Christian girl named uh, Philothiel is engaged to a Muslim boy named Ibrahim. But all of this will change when Turkey enters the modern world, epic and sweet, intoxicating in its Sensual detail, birds without wings, is an enchantment. So there you have it. It does sound damned interesting, at least to me. So I wouldn't be mad if this one kind of went through, but I don't think it will. Okay, next on my list, I have The Manning Tree Witches. And this is by A.K. Blackmore. It says, England, 1643... Puritanical fervor has gripped the nation. And in Manning Tree, a town depleted of men since the wars began, the hot terror of damnation burns in the hearts of women left to their own devices. Rebecca West, fatherless and husbandless, chafes against the drudgery of her days, livened only occasionally by her infatuation with the handsome young clerk, John Eads. But then a newcomer, Matthew Hopkins, arrives, a mysterious, pious figure dressed from head to toe in black. He takes over the thorn inn and begins to ask questions about what the women on the margins of this, dis this diminished community are, are up to. Dangerous rumors of co covens, packs, and bodily, bodily wants have begun to hang over women like Rebecca, and the future is as frightening as it is thrilling. 
Okay, this could be interesting as well, but you know, I don't really care that much about these this witch situation. Yeah, I mean, it's like, okay, I mean, if it gets too fine, I would read it and, and be okay with it, but I don't think I would go out of my way to vote for it. Uh, yeah, I'm just not that interested in it. Okay, next on the list, we have Letters to the Lost, which is by Ayana Gray. This says, I promise to love you forever in a time when I didn't know if I'd live to see the start of another week. Now it looks like forever is finally running out. I never stopped loving you. I tried for the sake of my own sanity, but I never even got close. And I never stopped hoping either. Late on a frozen February evening, a young woman is running through the streets of London. Having fled from her abusive boyfriend and with nowhere to go, Jess stumbles onto a forgotten lane where a small, clearly unlived in old house offers her best chance of shelter for the night. The next morning, a mysterious letter arrives and when she can't help but open it, she finds herself drawn inexorably into the story of two lovers from another time. Okay, so yeah, there's a little bit of romance. It's a World War II historical. Mm, I don't really care. Yeah, I don't really care about this one. All right, the next one is called Midwife, and it's by Trisha Cresswell. Never heard of this one before? Uh, it says 1830. After a violent storm, a woman is found alone, naked, near death on the Northumberland Moors. She has no memory of who she is or how she got there. But she can remember how to help a woman in labor, how to expertly dress a wound, and can speak fluent French. With the odds against her, a penniless single woman, she starts to build her life from scratch using her skills to help other women around her. She finds a happy place in the world until tragedy strikes and she must run for her life. Okay, so this sounds like it could be interesting. It's got a little bit of intrigue in there and stuff. Yeah, I wouldn't be mad if it, you know, if it made it through. I wouldn't be mad at it. I would, you know, I would like, yeah, I'd be all right with that. All right, the next one is called The Seal Woman's Gift, and it's by Sally Magnuson. Okay, I've never heard of this book before, but it has a beautiful cover. Okay, so it says, in 1627, Barbary pirates raided the coast of Iceland and abducted some 400 of its people, including 250 from a tiny island off mainland. Among the captives sold into slavery in Algiers were the island pastor, his wife, and their three children. Although the raid itself is well documented, Little is known about what happened to the women and children afterwards. It was a time when women everywhere were largely silent. In this brilliant reimagining, Sally Magnuson gives a voice to a Asta, the pastor's wife. Enslaved in an alien Arab culture, Asta meets the loss of both her freedom and her children with the one thing she has brought from home. The stories in her head. Steeped in the sagas and folk tales of her northern homeland, she finds herself experiencing not just the separations and agonies of captivity, but the reassessments that come in any age when intelligent eyes are opened to other lives, other cultures, and other kinds of loving. Okay, that sounds really interesting. I get on board with that. I get down with that. If that made it through, I could definitely, yeah, see myself reading that very easily. So it, it looks like this historical fiction list has been a lot better than the previous list that we had. And then last but not least, we have The Great Train Robbery. I think we can kind of figure out what this one is about. I think we know. It says, lavish wealth and appalling poverty live side by side in Victorian London. And Edward Pierce easily navigates both worlds. Rich, handsome, and ingenious, he charms the city's most prominent citizens even as he plots the crime 
of his century, the daring theft of a fortune in gold. But even Pierce could not predict the consequences of an extraordinary robbery that targets the pride of England's industrial era, the mighty steam locomotive. Based on remarkable fact and alive with the gripping suspense, surprise, and authenticity that are his trademarks, Michael Crichton's classic adventure is a breathtaking thrill ride that races along tracks of steel at breakneck speed. Ah, I don't really care about this. Yeah, I don't really care. But if I had to read it, I would just grin and bear it and read it. So there you have it. That is all in the historical fiction list. I will be back with the biography memoir list and literary fiction. So yeah. Pray for me because this is so hard. This is so hard. Pray for me.